Uh, okay. Hi, everyone, and welcome to By Daily Riyadh first meetup of 2021. I'm Dania, and working alongside me, Ruba Abdirillah, Sara, and the chair of By Daily Riyadh, Abdirillah Masfer. Uh, we are excited to welcome Mark Needham, uh, developer relation engineer and graph advocate at Neo4j. Uh, he also co-authored the O'Reilly Graph Algorithms book, which you can check on his blog post, uh, markhneedham.com. Uh, before I hand it over to you, Mark, I just want to inform the attendees that we are, uh, you're muted on entry, but if you have a question, you can raise your hand or ask uh, or unmute and ask, and also you can use the chat. And um, yeah, the session is recorded. Uh, so yeah, that's it for me. I'm handing it over to you, Mark. Uh, let's just go. Okay, cool. Okay, let me just, uh... there we go. Hello, everybody, welcome. Uh, welcome to this, to this talk. So yeah, my, uh, as Denny, I said, my name, is, my name is Mark. Um, that's my uh, Twitter handle if you want to ask me. Um, Anything about uh, any questions on anything? So let me add them. Um, so this talk is going to be uh, well, it's called an intro to graph data science, which is kind of I suppose it's like a subset of stuff that you can do with graphs. But I'll explain it. Um, I'll explain it as we go. And obviously, if you have any questions, you can either ask them on the chat uh, or feel free to unmute yourself on the Zoom and ask them there. Uh, okay, let's uh, let's go, carry on then. Um, so this is the um, the agenda of what we're going to do. <coughs> so we're not really going to we'll touch a little bit on graph databases, but we're mostly going to be sitting in kind of the graph data science world. So we'll sort of explain what that is. Um, one one part of it is graph algorithms. So we'll talk about that. Um, so that'll be kind of the first sort of half will be kind of theoretical. Then we're going to um, talk about uh, the Neo4j graph data science library, which is a bunch of uh, kind of tools for doing data science stuff um, in Neo4j, which is a, which a graph, which is a graph database. We'll, we'll get onto that. Uh, and then hopefully the majority of the talk will be me showing you uh, like a demo of, of stuff that you can do. So you get a rough idea of what types of problems you can solve with these techniques. So that's the plan. Um, so I guess a, a quite a good place to start is what is uh, what is data science? So Wikipedia uh, classifies it here. So interdisciplinary field that uses scientific methods, process, algorithms and systems to extract knowledge and insights from structured and unstructured data. Uh, so you could imagine, you could think of that as like this diagram on the left, so kind of combining statistics, machine learning, data analysis, all of those together gives you data science. And across all of those fields, what we're trying to do is we're trying to take, we have some questions that we want to answer, and we're trying to use data um, to solve them. So I think that's a, that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good, pretty good definition to start uh, from. So what does putting the graph in front of the data science mean? Well, like a lot of the, a lot of it stays the same, um, but it adds some extra things. So rather than just using data in, in as a more generic um, term to answer questions, we're ask, answering questions asking questions that can be answered by using relationships to, to answer them. And we'll, we'll cover what, what does that actually mean. Um, but one way of thinking about it is instead of combining like the stats and the machine learning like we had before, this time now we've got graph queries, we've got graph algorithms, and we've got graph visualizations all combining together to give us um, some tools that we can use to, to answer our problems. And the problems that we're answering are ones where the structure, like the kind of the way the data is linked together or the structure that, that exists uh, in the data is useful for answering those questions rather than maybe relying on uh, purely statistical methods, which we might be doing in a purely data science approach. Uh, okay, so, oh, there we go. Oh no, so I went back again. Um, so it kind of breaks down into two sort of sort of uh, sort of parts um, so what we mean by relationships is, is that we're built so we're building we're building a graph uh, and in a graph we might have some entities representing uh, different bits of data and then those those entities will be connected together so so, so we might so we could like a simple one would be let's build a graph 
of the people who are in the, say in the PyData Riyadh meetup group, for example, and we say, okay, we've got the meetup group, we've got some people who are members of the meetup group, and perhaps the meetup group has some topics that it is uh, advertises or that, that it covers, and we link out to those topics. And then maybe the people who are in the group also specified some interests in topics. And so maybe we can, that could be like a graph that we could use to try and make some suggestions of other interesting groups that you might want to join as well as the Pi data uh, re one. Well. And doing that type of, uh, like that type of query or that solving that type of problem would be like a more query based approach. So it's kind of like over to the left hand side of this diagram. Um, so here we're saying we're, we're doing local, we call it local decision making or, or pattern matching. And so we're starting from a certain place. Um, so maybe one of the people who's a member of the group, we're having a look maybe at the interests that they have, and then we're trying to find groups that have those topics in common. And so we're starting in a, in a very specific part of the graph, and then sort of looking around it to try and find um, the answers to some questions. Uh, that's the left-hand side of this diagram. On the right-hand side, we've got uh, what we call the global computation approach. And here we're more interested in looking at the whole graph. So we want to like, consider everything. We can look at all the data. Um, and it might not, and it probably will mean that the answers that we get from this right hand side are, one, are not going to be real time queries because we are querying uh, all the data and in bigger graphs the results are going to take longer to, to come back. Um, but here we can do different types of things so we can kind of work out uh, like what, uh, and we'll go into, we'll break these down, we could like find out which are the most important nodes in a graph, like how are nodes clustered together, uh, like what's the fastest way to go between two nodes in a graph uh, and sort of more yeah, kind of more complicated uh, computation like that. Um, so the NeoJ graph data science uh, library allows us to do some of these things. So you can kind of see here some of the things that it does. Um, so NeoJ in general has been aimed at developers, like application developers building um, transactional applications. So ones where maybe it's the, the backing database for uh, a web application or a mobile phone application and the, the graph data science library is the first time that it's uh, built some tools that are specifically aimed at data scientists to solve analytics problems. Um, so that's kind of an overview of what it is. Um, these are some of the problems that, that we sort of see people trying to solve. So we're kind of going from the left, um, sort of decision support type things and kind of build a, a knowledge, knowledge graph and graph are sometimes interchangeably used. Um, the idea of it being a knowledge graph means that we don't really care about the schema. Like we, we're happy to add in lots of different information. Um, weirdly, like the, the term knowledge graph is most famous for the little, um, I guess you've seen the little info box you get on the side of Google when you search for uh, like a famous person or, or like a famous movie and it will come up and say, hey, here's all the information that we have about, uh, about this thing. So that's an example uh, of a knowledge graph, but you can build those uh, yourself as well. So it's kind of like, one where you don't really, where you're quite kind of happy with lots of different uh, information being loaded in. And then perhaps you're even connecting some of that data up to like a source of truth. So maybe you're connecting it to something like the Wikipedia reference for, uh, for an entity. So maybe we're uh, doing some text analysis and pulling out, okay, they, these entities exist inside this document. And actually this entity is this Wikipedia page and another one is a different Wikipedia page. So it's kind of combining like the, the, the two, two types of, of data together. Uh, if we come into the, to the next one, graph analytics. So this is the idea of running uh, a graph algorithm. So for example, maybe we're going to run um, a page rank algorithm. We're going to get into these as we go. Maybe we're going to run a page rank algorithm to find out who's the uh, most important node in the graph. Or maybe we're running the shortest path algorithm to find the fastest way uh, to go from one train station to the other. Uh, if we come over to the next one, so graph feature engineering. So this is the idea that can we use those graph algorithms? Can we use the value from there as part of the input um, to a machine learning model? So can we can we generate some features uh, that we're going to use rather than just? So this would be like a, kind of a like supplementary to the features that you would have, maybe like more static features. We're, we're generating graph features. Um, the next one is graph embedding. So this is sort of I guess it's a bit similar to like uh, the word embeddings where you're generating like an array of numbers to represent a word. Here we're generating an array of numbers to represent like almost reduce the dimensionality of a node in a graph. So graphs can sometimes be quite complicated or complex in structure and it's not very easy to visualize it. 
Um, and machine learning models generally want, give me some numbers that I can use to represent each thing. So if we're doing um, like a link prediction problem or a, a node classification, maybe we just want some numbers to, uh, to represent that node. And then we can use those as the input to a model that's trying to work out uh, either like which genre is this movie uh, most likely associated with, or like, is there like which links are likely to appear in a graph as it evolves over time. And then sort of over to the far side is the idea of graph native learning. So this is where we can almost do the machine learning stuff inside, uh, inside the graph itself. So we don't have to like extract the data, do our uh, machine learning process somewhere else, and then write the results back in. Uh, and so the library now actually from, from the most recent release lets you do all of these things. Uh, it's, it's got more, it's stronger towards the left-hand side, but there are but more recent, most recent, it, a version adds in um, the graph uh, native learning um, stuff. Uh, okay, so um, there are generally sort of five types of, of algorithms uh, that we have. So we've got pathfinding and such, uh, we've got centrality, so this is kind of finding the important nodes, we've got community detection, uh, we've got link predictions, this is kind of um, computing like how likely are two nodes to be linked to each other, and then we've got similarity um, algorithms. So pathfinding would be, for example, find me the shortest path between two points. So I'm at one train station, I want to get to another one. How do I, what's the best way to get there? Uh, centrality would be, I've got a, let's say I've got a Twitter graph. So I've got a, let's say I've got a Twitter graph and I've got the followers um, of each of the people and maybe I've also got some tweets and I can see who's retweeting and liking things. Um, it, I could then work out like, which of the influences in, the net, in a network. Community detection, this is the idea of, can I find like clusters of people who are similar to each other in some way, or, or in particular, not similar uh, to the people who are in another um, community or cluster. So you'll see community and cluster kind of used interchangeably. They more or less mean, that, mean, mean the same thing. Uh, link prediction, um, can we figure out like how likely is there to be a link between two nodes? And then finally, similarity, like can we find um, common entities based on graph probability, like how similar is what this node to this other one, like based on um, some measure of similarity that we've, um, that we've specified. Uh, okay, so the GDS library itself has a lot of things. So these are the, these, this is a list of all of the um, procedures and functions that it, that it, that it has. So it covers most of, the, um, most of the, the main ones that you would want to use. Um, a lot of these are in NetworkX uh, as well, the Python uh, NetworkX library. Uh, but we found that the, the ones in NetworkX don't tend to scale uh, as well as the ones in the, in the GDS library. So they're pretty good if you're working with small data sets and you can fit everything in memory, like Python, Python wise. Uh, but once you're working with bigger data sets, um, you probably want to, want to use, you, this will probably be quite useful to you. Um, the ones in bold are what we call kind of productionized ones. So, uh, I'll explain what that means. And, and then the other ones are kind of in a beta or alpha um, level. Um, so you can kind of see there's lots of sort of lots of different pathfinding and search algorithms um, letting you do breadth and depth by search you can do shortest path you can do all pairs shortest path uh, you can do yen's k shortest path which kind of finds you the first shortest path sec second shortest path third shortest path uh, if we go over to the middle we've got some centrality algorithms so degree centrality like how many things are connected to you we've got between the centrality sort of like are you acting as a local bridge uh, between uh, parts of like of like in the flow of uh, information or traffic or whatever it is moving around the network. PageRank is kind of the, like, used to be the, the main part of the Google search uh, algorithm. Now it's kind of a component uh, added along with some, some other algorithms as well. Um, let's pick, maybe pick, pick one, one more. So if we, if we come across community detection, this is the idea of uh, some of those are um, so label propagation, for example, can we find out like what communities people belong in by a, a voting uh, mechanism? And then I'll pick one more, Levain uh, modularity. This is, uh, can we work out like, so on e like, it's kind of an iterative algorithm, but on e each iteration we're sort of working out like how, how good is, are the communities that we've come up with at the moment? Could, could it be better by moving a node to somewhere else? If it is, okay, let's move it there. And if it isn't, then we'll, then we'll leave it as it is. Uh, and you can see there are, there are some other ones on the screen as well. <laughs> I see I've got a typo under the graph embeddings. That, 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 sh that, that shouldn't be exactly the same as the similarity, but uh, hopefully I'll, I'll show you what we've actually got. Then you'll, you'll get the idea. 
Um, so this is what the, the syntax looks like. So you don't need to know the syntax. This is just to sort of show you how it works. So um, Neo4j uses a query language called uh, Cypher. So it's kind of like, I like to think of it as a SQL, but for graphs. And it has this extension mechanism uh, of procedures and functions that you can write, either you can write yourself uh, or you can use some pre-written libraries. And, what, and so GDS is one of those uh, libraries, so the GDS standing for, for graph data science. So all the procedures in this library start with GDS dot something. And the, the tool that we use to run them, I'll, I'll show you that in a minute, it has the like autocomplete on everything. So you don't necessarily need to, to memorize everything. Um, but the structure is it goes gds.tier, dot algorithm, dot execution mode, and then um, sometimes dot, dot estimate. And so the tier will say like what level of support is it? So if, if it's production tier, then there's no tier. Uh, if it's alpha, then it will say dot alpha. If it's beta, it'll say dot beta. And that kind of just means it, it works, but maybe it hasn't been tested or is used as much as the, as the ones in the higher tiers. Then we've got the name of the algorithm. We've got the execution mode. So this can be right streams and then if you want to see how much memory it's going to use you can also use an optional uh, estimate from here um, so estimate as i say here estimate will tell you how much in how much memory will it use so it will never it will never blow up it will if, if you try to run it and you don't have enough memory on the machine to actually run it uh, then it will just give you an error but you can actually check that before you run it uh, just to see whether that's going to happen, and then these are the these are the tiers. So we've got the production uh, product supported tier. So this is means that everything's been tested, like stability, scale, fully optimized. Beta means it's kind of just below that; it's candidate for being promoted. And then alpha means it's been recently moved, and it could be that the API is not uh, stable yet. So it probably is going to change as people use it and come up with. Uh, suggestions or maybe sometimes the names actually change as we come up with, with better names for things. Um, so how do you get this library? So um, I find most people using Neo4j tend to be using the, uh, if they're using it on their machine, they're using the Neo4j desktop. So I got a link uh, on the bottom of this slide. So neo4j.com slash developer Neo4j desktop. And it, I've created a little project in here. Um, and then you can see on the right hand side, you get uh, this plugins um, tab, and in there you can see there are four different four different things: APOC, Graph Data Science Library, GraphQL, Neo4j Streams, and the Graph Data Science Library is the one that we want. And it will tell you which version is compatible uh, with your Neo4j version. So in this example, our Neo4j version is 4.2.3, and then our Graph Data Science Library version is 1.5.0. Um, so you can either get it like that, or if you're deploying it somewhere and you're not using this tool, then you can go and download it manually. So you can get it from uh, nifj.com slash download center. Uh, and then that has all the uh, links to, to all the different ones that, you, that you'd want to download. And then on the bottom of the slide is a link to where the documentation lives. Uh, there's also a way of using all this with Docker. If you prefer to use Docker, there's a, like an environment variable that you can specify and it will go and pull down the appropriate version for you, depending on which Neo4j uh, container image that you're using. Um, and then uh, what the other tool that we're going to use is called the Graph Algorithms Playground. Um, and so this is a, what we call the Graph app. So these are kind of applications that can work alongside the database inside the Neo4j desktop. Uh, and this is a, it actually comes with the, with the desktop. So you can actually get from, get to it from inside the desktop now. Uh, and you, and, or if you want to manually, you can, you can go to this link and then it has install buttons for, for each of the, well, there's lots of different graph apps, but the one that we're interested in is the, the graph algorithms playground. Um, so what I want to do now, so I guess we've done about kind of 15 minutes. I'm going to, I'm going to do a demo of this now. And we're actually going to use a third way of, uh, of using Neo4j. So this is the Neo4j sandbox. I'll make it a bit bigger. So this is at uh, sandbox.neofj.com. Maybe I'll paste it in for you under, under chat. So that's this one. So these are these are an these are Docker images running on Fargate. So they're kind of running on AWS. So they're, they're sort of, uh, they run by default. It gives you three days. You can kind of see my one at the top. Uh, it says it expires in about three days, or 27th of February. Um, 
and they basically just give you a Neo4j uh, instance that you can use mostly just to play around with. Um, you can, you see, I've got a graph data science one of my own, and then I've got a Twitter one that you can see someone else has shared with me. Um, you can create lots of different ones in here. So I've created the graph data science one already, but normally that would show up on here. Um, you can create a blank one, you can create a spreadsheet, you can create movies, lots of different, I've got a Women's World Cup one uh, from last year's uh, World Cup. Um, I've got OpenStreetMap and then there's, you can kind of see there are a few other ones as well. And these will preload the data set for you. Um, once you've got that loaded, you can then click on it and it will give you like a list of actions. It'll show you connection details. Um, so for example, this is, this is my one. Uh, it also gives you some sample code if you want to use it. Um, so I guess we would want to use the Python um, sample so we can uh, basically copy paste this bit of code if we wanted to. Uh, and then we could use it, kind of use it locally and you can see it's connecting to this uh, remote server and then these are the credentials that it's using and it's just executing a simple query. Um, we can also open this database in a bunch of tools we can use what we call the Neo4j browser. Uh, we can use Neo4j Bloom or we can use uh, Neuler, which is the, the graph algorithms playground. So we're gonna use the first one and the third one. But I'm gonna first show you uh, what it looks like in the Neo4j browser. So I've already got it open uh, over here. So this is the, uh, the Neo4j browser. Now, if you use this locally, it will automatically load, I think, um, well, this is, this is what we call a guide, what's on the screen. If you run this locally, you'll get play, I think it's play intro, it's like the default one. So it'll load you, this is what you'll get. Uh, but because we're using it on, uh, on this sandbox, uh, we, we've, we've overridden the, uh, the default one. And so we get this uh, data science uh, guide instead. And this is kind of just like, a, it's like a sort of self-guided tutorial that you can walk through the library uh, and get the hang of what, uh, what you can do. So, I'm just going to move that out of the way. So uh, this is an explanation of the data set. So this is using um, data from uh, the network of thrones. So it's actually not the graph, not the Game of Thrones a TV show, but it's actually the books. Uh, and so it has all sorts of, uh, it has like data pulled in from there. It's also got from this um, Game of Thrones repository by Thomas Bradenach, and it's got a, uh, another Kaggle one as well. So there's actually a lot of uh, different data sets all kind of merged together. Uh, one of those is the interaction data set. So um, uh, Andrew Beveridge has, has kind of uh, taken the uh, the books, he's kind of got the like OCR, the books, and then he's got like all the, the transcripts of what happens in there and detects uh, which characters are likely of, to have interacted with or spoke, interacted or spoken to each other but based on whether their names appear within 15 words or 15 tokens of each other in the text. And then it builds like a graph of person interacts with person. If you click on this uh, little database uh, icon in the top left-hand side of my screen, uh, you can see you get an overview of what's in the database. You can see we've got a database name, so we've got Neo4j database, and then we've got a system database. Uh, we've got some node labels. So node labels, these are like, um, kind of similar to table names. It's a way of um, kind of categorizing or grouping a node. Um, you can put one label on a node or you can put multiple if you want. So we could click, say if we click on some person nodes, um, then we'll get this. Uh, it's actually drawn some relationships between them. I'll just turn that off so we can, so if you go here, uh, by default, uh, it will attempt, this, this tool attempts to draw relationships between everything that's on the screen, which can sometimes get a bit messy. Uh, so we'll just turn that off for now. So there we go. So that's uh, connect result nodes down here. So you see now we've got some, we've got some people. So we've got Dagmar Kleftjo, we've got Ramsey Snow. You can see there are some people who are in different colors. So for example, Clay Serwin, you can see if you, if you look on the, down here on the left-hand side, this person is dead and they're a person. So you can kind of add multiple labels on. And then the ones in, uh, in blue, they have a person label and a knight label. So you can put multiple labels onto things, but you, equally you could put zero labels on something, although it's, I'd say that's less common. I normally see people put at least one um, label onto their, uh, onto their notes. And then what you can see next to it, are these are what we call 
uh, if I can get that to stay still. Um, so just underneath, these are properties. So for example, we can see here, gender is male, name is Stanis Baratheon, page rank has got a score, WCC underscore partition has got a different score. If you double click on any of these nodes, it will expand the relationships around them. So you can see there, if we double click on Ramsey Snow, you can see it's brought in a bunch of uh, other people as well. We can click on this button up here. I want to maximize it. Um, so you can see we've kind of got loads of loads of other people loaded in. And you can see it's got like, for example, Interacts 3. So that means they spoke to each other in book three. Interacts 2, that means they spoke to each other in book two. Uh, and then there's also just a general interacts. So that means how many times did you speak to the other person in any, in any of the books? Um, so that's kind of your crash course of what Neo4j looks like. Then we've got uh, underneath, so we've kind of shown how to expand relationship types. You can also see a list of all the ones that exist in a graph in here. And then these are all the property keys that exist in the, in the database. If we want to explore this graph a bit more, uh, we can then click through the guides. So it'll, if you wanted to load the data, if you were using this from scratch, this is how you load all the data in. So it's kind of got, a, got some instructions of how to do that, but we don't, we don't need to do that because it's already, already loaded. But it is, yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a big script. You can kind of see, um, but that's how you would create the data from scratch. You can also draw a graph of the graph. So there's this, DB schema visualization uh, procedure. You can see it's kind of a bit, a bit messy. Uh, some of the, we stretch it out, I guess, to a little bit better. This node down here is from the Neo4j Bloom tool. So this is kind of just the metadata for that. That's why it doesn't connect to anything. Uh, but you can see here, it says that it's because of all these interaction properties, you can see there's loads of them. So it's saying people can interact with each other, people can interact with knights, knights can interact with the dead, houses can, inter houses can belong to the dead. Uh, it basically like um, has a bunch of metadata that it keeps on the data that you've put into the database and then it kind of captures uh, all of that and shows you, hey, here's a graph, here's a metagraph of, of, of what's actually been stored uh, in this database. Um, Actually, maybe we'll just quickly, maybe I'll just quickly show you what the import statement looks like so you can see what this, uh, what the query language is like. So there's this tool called load CSV uh, and we've got, we're, we're basically processing loads of CSV files containing uh, different data. So maybe we can, we can, let's see if it'll let me browse to one of them. Uh, oh, that opens it down here, let's see. I can, uh, I'll just show you what that file looks like so you can get a, so you can actually just do this. So this is like a command in the query language for processing CSV files. So this CSV file, you can see this is the first row. It contains a note, a year, summer, major death, the name of the attacker king, the attack command. So this is a bunch of battles and the information about the battles. And then what we're doing is we're saying, if we load it up again, we're saying I want to create one node for each battle. And then I want to capture store like a bunch of metadata about the battle. So I want to store the year, the summer, the major deaths and major captures that happened in there, uh, the attack size and the defense size. Then we're processing it again. So we're loading in the, the battles for a second, we're kind of processing that file twice. Uh, and this time we are uh, creating a node for the attacker and we're sort of kind of building out the graph. So we've got the battle in the middle, we've got an attacker going into the attack and then we've got somebody trying to defend uh, the, on, on, in the battle as well. So we're kind of building up a big battle graph. So it's kind of a, it's kind of, it's a sort of a bit of a complicated uh, import statement, but this is what it's doing. It's building up um, kind of a graph of, of the attack of the different battles and if we wanted to have a look at those battles we could go here we could say okay i'm going to just click on the battles and maybe we'll have a look at one of them so this is the battle of the crag of the crag and we see that rob stark is the attack king tom, tom and baratheon's defending and then it indicates where it is who else is defending who else is participating in the attack and who else is defending so you kind of get a whole that's like one of the one of the bits of the graph and then there are loads of other 
there's loads of other stuff loaded in here as well as the battles. So it's got the battles, it's got the interactions, it's got the houses, it's got the appearances of people. Uh, this is kind of a, a well, it's like 400 lines of uh, import statements. It's pretty, uh, pretty uh, heavy, I guess. Uh, if we just close those bits down, so that's the data ingestion. Um, but what I want to show you is how you can run. Um, so you could run some simple queries on this. So you could run like something just in Cypher. So this is kind of on the graph querying side of things, if you like. So we can say, hey, I want to find like the a histogram of the interactions of people in the graph. So find me the minimum number of interactions, which is one, the maximum 170, the average is just under seven, and then, but there's a big standard deviation of uh, of 14. Um, I think we could also do the percentiles, although I can't remember exactly what the function is to do that. And then if we want to run, yeah, so you could, yeah, you could, you could estimate the memory. Let's skip that forward a bit. Uh, so we can also create in-memory graphs. So at the moment, all this, this graph is all stored like on disk. Um, but the GDS library, because it basically, it, needs to get to data very, very quickly, it loads like an in-memory, like sort of a super optimized in-memory version of the graph. So for, and the way we can create one is by running this gds.graph.create command. Um, so this one is creating the Game of Thrones interactions. So it's saying I want to load the person labels. So remember the labels, the interacts and the relationship type. And I'm going to consider that relationship to be undirected. So if uh, I interact with somebody, then we assume they interact back with me. So we're not going to, we're not going to assume that has a direction. Um, and then what we can do is we can, we can then run an algorithm over that graph. So we could, for example, run the page rank uh, algorithm. Um, so we can run that one like that uh, and it will come back and tell us uh, which nodes are the most kind of in, transitively influential. So the way the page rank algorithm works is that if somebody, in this case, if somebody interacts with you, they're kind of saying you're important. If somebody, and, and, and it kind of works out transitive importance. So I interacted with you, you interacted with someone else, they interacted with someone else. And so the more of those transitive interactions you've got, the more important you are. And if you're being interacted with by other important people, then you're considered more important. So in, in, if we do it for the interacts across the whole graph, uh, then it considers Jon Snow is the most important, Tyrion Lannister second, <coughs> Cersei is third, uh, and Jamie is fourth. Um, so you can do this. You can kind of you can kind of do this manually. You can sort of play around with the results. You can do this for for all the different ones. You can this one is streaming the results back. You can also store the results in the database if you wanted to use it afterwards. Um, I find this, this, is, this kind of assumes that you sort of know the syntax of what you're doing. If you don't yet know it and you just want to get like the syntax to copy and paste, then the graph um, algorithms playground is a better, better place. So graph algorithms playground, graph data science playground, th those names are sort of interchangeable. Uh, and this is a UI tool that you, can, that you can use. So you can use it locally if you're in the DFNJ desktop or you can use it uh, remotely. Um, so if you're using it in here, you can click open with Neuler in the sandbox and then it'll, it will open uh, or, you can, or you can click on a, on, a, on a link and it will kind of auto populate the, the login details that you need. And it connects, checks, the, checks all the plugins exist and then you've got to choose which database you use and then, uh, then you'll be able to, uh, to launch it. Uh, once you're in, you can either use an individual algorithm or you can use a recipe, which is basically a combination of uh, of algorithms. In this case, we're going to just run a single one. Uh, and we could start with, let's start with degree centrality. So this is just counting how many uh, relationships come into each node. So we'll do say person interacts in say season one. Uh, we'll say we don't care about the relationship direction and then we'll run. Um, so if we run that, we see that Edward Stark is at the top. Uh, you can choose what gets displayed. So here it's doing the ti their title and the name. We could remove their title and then we'll just have the names uh, in there. Uh, we can also, uh, oh yeah, because it's loaded in a few other labels as well. Um, so we've got the person, dead, king, and, and knight. Um, we can kind of play around with this if we wanted to see the code. We can go over to this code view. 
Uh, and then it will show you like what code you need to copy. So you can kind of copy this code. And um, for example, I could copy this. Um, this thing here. And then copy this one here. And this one over here. And it will then do the same thing as what we are, what we've been running ourselves over there. So you can see we get should get the same results. So it's Eddard Stark in first place uh, with a score of 66. Uh, you can also generate uh, what we call a browser guide. So you can call, click on this button here, uh, send to browser. You can copy that. And then I can uh, kind of paste that in here. Uh, and it will show me a guide with the same, same thing. So it sort of generates your guide with everything filled in for you. Uh, going back to here, um, so you can look at the results, yeah, you can see it as a chart, uh, or you can do it as a, as a visualization as well. Um, so that's a visualization of the uh, kind of relationships between the top uh, nodes that are showing on the uh, under graph. Uh, we could then go back here and we could say I want to edit the configuration. Let's say we wanted to run the page rank algorithm. So we could click on that one. So you can see here it tells you this measures the transitive influence or connectivity of nodes. So again, we'll say I want to do it just for people. Uh, I want to do it, let's say we'll do it for season two. I don't know. Uh, we'll say I'm directed and maybe we'll consider the, can we consider the number of interactions? Is that a thing? So wait. And maybe this time we we'll store the results in the page rank property. Uh, so if we do that and we store the results, <coughs> we get some slightly different people ranking higher here. Again, we can, we can visualize the, the results. Uh, or we could do a chart. So this sort of chart will show us like how are these people ranking. Um, a cool thing we can now do is, but is maybe we can we can have a look at one of the um, community detection algorithms. So let's do that on say do that on season two as well. So if we pick uh, interacts with season two. Um, if you've already run a community detection algorithm, you can also specify a seed property and it will kind of use that as a starting point, which would mean that it then computes it quicker. Uh, let's say we'll store the results. It's Lee Bain. And let's say we do a push of 50 nodes per community. Uh, so if we run this, uh, so you can see we get back, these are the communities that it finds. Uh, you can see Daenerys ends up sort of in a in a different community because because uh, in season two they were not they were not interacting uh, with anybody else. I think this one actually might be more obvious if we run uh, run one of the other ones. If we try, so Levain is. Um, hang on a sec. Um, hopefully that didn't. Dania, is my sound still working fine or not? Uh, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, sometimes the computer goes crazy and changes the microphone. <laughs> uh, so we can change this to say connected components. So this one is just trying to see like, are you reachable? So then if you're reachable, you'll end up in the same community. Whereas with the Levain one, you could, that, that would not, you, you end up kind of with more communities. Uh, so if we say we've got a person and season two, Uh, you see, we end up with actually we still end up with everybody, everybody interacting with uh, with everybody else in there. So that was in uh, that was in season two, uh, but you see, you kind of get some people completely uh, completely on their own. Uh, and then the the other thing that we can do so if we is you can go back to the old ones. So we can go back to the Sylvain one, and we could visualize the and visualize the communities that it's come up with. Let's see if that's going to work. Maybe not. We'll leave that for now then. Maybe there's a, oh no, there we go. Oh, it's just taking a while to load. Uh, and so this time it will load the kind of different communities in, uh, in different colors. So you see we get, uh, although it doesn't seem, title is not a very good, uh, property that it's picked, maybe name is better. 
kind of you know, so you can kind of see like the red is one community, the blue is another one, the orange over here. And then you could change, you could say, I want to do the size of the nodes based on the property name. So you could say, I'm going to do the size based on the page rank property. And so you, now you start to see, it makes the important ones that we identified. So Daenerys is bigger, Jon Snow is bigger, Bran Stark, all the, all the kind of main characters start to start stand up. I mean, admittedly, this visualization ends up being a bit of a mess because all the, all the characters are kind of on top of each other. Uh, but you can still sort of identify the important people uh, in here. So yeah, so this tool is good, like for, for when you're getting started, I, I think this is a pretty good place uh, to start. Like I would use this uh, once I was getting started, even actually, even if I already knew what I was doing, just to get a, some code to start with, you can just copy paste it and then put it back into the, uh, into the DMPJ browser and then, uh, and then continue from there. Um, and yeah, I guess this was this was more or less what I what I was hoping to to show you. So I'll go back to my slides again, just to just to conclude. Um, so if you find this interesting and, and you want to want to like learn a bit more on your own, um, as Dania said at the start, um, my colleague Amy and I uh, wrote a book uh, called Graph Algorithms, and you can get a copy of it neopj.com slash graph hyphen algorithms book. So it's free. Free PDF. You can uh, you can just download that, and then I put some links up here for the things that we looked at. So we looked at the data science sandbox that's on there. We looked at the Neo4j desktop. There's a link on the top, and then the documentation is um, just down the bottom. And then there's a blog post that one of my uh, one of my colleagues wrote showing how to how to use it. I don't know if anybody had. I guess nobody. I didn't see that anybody asked any questions so far. But if you have any questions, yeah, just, you can uh, always ask them now as well. Uh, because maybe some of them the weren't here at the start, feel free to like either drop a question in the chat or unmute yourself and ask. Uh, I think we have around 10 minutes for Q and A's. Okay, we do have some questions in the chat. Uh, yeah, so for um, fraud detection, um, we've seen people using graph algorithms to generate features um, that they might use um, in like a fraud detection detection model. So we actually have, uh, if I, we actually have another kind of mini sort of ebook that we wrote. Uh, Maybe I can paste the link for that. So we wrote this kind of ebook called Graph Data Science for Dummies. And in there, we did like a little uh, walkthrough of, um, of, a, of how you might use it for fraud detection. And I'm trying to see where the chat's gone. So I can paste it in there. Um, so we kind of used it, yeah, we used it for that. Um, more re most to, like more recently, uh, yeah. So that that's kind of one use case. Like people, I guess there's kind of three ways to use it. So um, you could use this for recommendations. So you could you could go and sort of generate similarities of things in a graph, and then you could say, hey, you are similar to this other person, for example, and they bought these other things. So maybe you're interested in buying them, or perhaps we're trying to recommend content to somebody uh, on a on a website and we're like, we could find out who's similar to you. What have they been doing? Let's recommend you that content. Or um, as I say, we, use, we see people using the graph algorithms. You could, you could use them completely on their own. Um, so we, we have like a, a online training, like a self-paced um, training course uh, where we show how you would, how you might build a web app to do it. I'm just trying to remember which one it is. Uh, oh, it's not that one. Uh, which one is it? It is this one, Applied Graph Data Science for Web Applications. I'll paste that in. So in this one, we have like a, we have like a web application that we're building. 
Um, I'm not sure which data set it's on. When we wrote the first version, we were using a Yelp data set and we were kind of looking at how would you write like a, an app on Yelp that, that, that kind of reviews a website and how would you use the um, graph algorithms to improve the, the, the web app. Um, uh, yeah, so non-classification problems. So if you were, so one would be, uh, by the way, actually, let me show you. So in, uh, in this playground, if you didn't have, well, maybe we'll make ourselves a database. Let's make ourselves a new database. So, so create. So I've got a new Twitter database, which is come over here. So if you load it with a database that doesn't have anything in it, it'll say, hey, you want to use one of the sample graphs. So we have a Twitter graph here. Um, so this one has, this is from a couple of years ago when it was pretty easy. There was this tool called Twit, or there is this tool called Twit, <coughs> which is able to scrape Twitter uh, and pull in loads of, loads of information much faster than the API limits used to allow you to do that. So I got like a loads of the, 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 the network around uh, people tweeting about NFJ on Twitter. Uh, and so you could do like say, hey, find me the find me the important people uh, on Twitter, for example. So if I want to know, like, if I wanted to do just some quick network analysis of people tweeting about me for J, I could run um, one of these algorithms, and I could uh, I could have a look at the results. So this is, I mean, obviously this is a graph of Neo Neo stuff. So you can kind of see Neo for J account is the most popular graph. Connect is the Neo for J conference. Um, this is using betweenness and centrality. So this one computes. If I was finding the shortest path between all the nodes in the graph, how many times do you sit on that shortest path? So these are kind of central in sort of the way that shortest paths are computed. Uh, so you can see the NFJ accounts first. Graph Connect, that's the NFJ conference, is second. Will Lyon, this is one of my colleagues, is, is next. Um, you can see Emil, that's the CEO of NFJ, TechCrunch, I guess. Probably know what that one is. Um, and we could do all sorts of like uh, influence analytics. So we could say, let's see which person is transitively the most connected. Um, so we could, we could run that and see how similar the, the results are. So you see here, it's slightly different. So now ML is, is ranking higher. Um, this one's based more on like who's actually following you, like that's an important thing rather than how are you sitting in the graph uh, and connecting people together. So this kind of pulls out almost like your influencers in, uh, in, in, in a particular community. So you get quite famous people here. So you get the Amazon Web Services um, account as well. So we could change and say show the, show the actual Twitter screen name. Uh, you get Emil again, Michael Hunger is the de DevRel person at NEO. You get Hilary Mason is a big person in the data science community, Kelly Summers as well. Kirk Bourne, uh, I think he's a very, very big data science uh, central uh, person. So yeah, you can use it for, and you can kind of see the other categories. So we, classification is everything under here. Um, pathfinding is a, a sort of different ones. I'm not sure how, how easy that would work on here. We could say like, uh, So ML to me is, is just one up, um, probably because I, yeah, I, I, I follow ML, so it comes up with, uh, with that. Um, so you can do pathfinding, you can do classification, you can do um, influence analytics, centrality, uh, computation. I just show you what the, uh, the, the kind of full list of stuff looks like. So these are all the things. So centrality, we talked about community detection. We talked about pathfinding. We talked about similarity. Uh, I guess we didn't show an example of that, but this is the idea of can we find like which nodes are similar to each other based on the common structure that they have. And then the most recently added stuff for these machine learning models for doing node classification and link prediction kind of inside the graph rather than having to use a tool like a SageMaker or uh, scikit-learn or whichever other tool that it's used. Hopefully that was what you were, what you were asking. 
Uh, if you want use cases in general, I think we have a, it's probably a better page than I could ever manage to see. So this is kind of like a splash page sort of with use cases listed which probably goes into more probably more detail than I will be able to do. Thank you for sharing that link. Uh, and thank you, Esme, for the question. Um, so anyone has any other questions? Okay, I think we can wrap it up. I must say, Mark, uh, this has been really quite an interesting journey. Uh, excited to use this knowledge and many use cases that I came up with while you're <laughs> you were presenting it. Oh, cool. So yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's quite fun. Like one uh, example would be we were trying to identify who would be employees that are. Uh, institution who would be like uh, essential to us so yeah okay. uh, that would be a fun use case to use <laughs> on. yeah uh, cool. thank you everyone for attending and thanks mark uh we hope to see yeah. you all in uh, by data we have meetups yeah that's a wrap thanks <laughs>